him to be meeting in here again. Um, and what a blessed day it is to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
may be seated. Today's reading is out of Galatians chapter 6, verses 11 through 18. And I think through these verses, Paul really wants them to understand it the way that verse 11 starts. It says, See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised obey the law. Yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God. Finally, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen.
I, mean, I know the fires are blazing everywhere and uh, virus is running around and uh, we're really not meeting inside here to flout uh, government or anything. That's not the case at all. We're just simply trying to survive as a church. Um, but uh, uh, do, do, do what I'm going to join with you for uh, a brief word of prayer. Lord, uh, we do lift up uh, our, our country, our state, in, in this uh, time. Uh, for, it just seems like one uh, difficulty piled on top of another. Just all kinds of stuff going on. I know there's a lot of unrest and a lot of uh, uh, discomfort uh, with regards to all kinds of things. We, we just pray, Lord, in accordance with your, your scripture. We pray for our leaders, we pray for our president, we pray for uh, our, Gavin, our governor, uh, Gavin Newsom. We pray, Lord, that you would give our leaders wisdom and insight. We don't always agree with everything that uh, they uh, express or do, but uh, we nonetheless uh, abide by your word and, and lift them up and ask for their, uh, ask you to uh, give them leadership, give them conviction and wisdom. We pray, Lord, for those who are fighting these fires, uh, firemen, uh, all the emergency personnel. Pray for those, Lord, who have been victimized by these fires. We just ask, Lord, if you could send rain or just do something to help us uh, in this very difficult situation. A lot of people are homeless uh, and just, uh, just brokenhearted from uh, the results of this all up and down in the western Western states, Lord, we just ask that, that you'd be with be with us as we endure this difficulty. Pray that you'd be um, with uh, with Calvary, be with the uh, um, ministry here in Los Banos, our sister churches who are meeting even now as we speak. We pray, Lord, that uh, uh, in all these things we would be uh, upright people in your sight, uh, and as well as a testimony to others of uh, Christian grace. We pray these things in the name of the, the provider of that grace, Christ Jesus. Amen. Uh, if you turn with me in your Bibles, uh, as Shane has read, um, Galatians chapter 6. Uh, for the past several weeks, we've been uh, looking at Paul's letter to the Galatians <clears throat> and the issues brought up by uh, Jewish circumcisers. I'm not sure what else you would call them, Judaizers. I know there's all kinds of different names, but the Galatians were experiencing divisions over... Uh, the, uh, the matter uh, matter significant enough to involve the apostle uh, who had founded this particular church and now offers uh, this rather uh, harsh and critical response to what was was going on at the time. It's sort of like uh, you know political partisan uh, ads uh, during uh, these uh, campaigns. There were all sorts of rumors floating around about circumcision, whether it was necessary for church membership. And of course, everybody had their opinions. And, of stuff. Well, at times uh, in this letter, it appears as though Paul is just, you know, offering his uh, apostolic opinion. When it came right down to it, and, and he'll express as much as we look at this, uh, he was dogmatically opposed to these circumcisers for being not only uh, heretical, but just out, flat out wrong. And, and he's not going to uh, back off of that very much at all. He's going to come down pretty hard. And so, Something was wrong in Galatia, that's the way you would describe it, uh, and it had to be dealt with in a rather matter-of-factly way. Now most of us, and I'm this way, you know, we're willing to agree to disagree about matters that can't be resolved without arguments or, or hurt feelings, especially when it comes to politics. I kind of got to go one way or the other. Uh, even most dyed-in-the-wool Southern Baptists will grant uh, that groups as theologically distant as uh, Roman Catholics and Pentecostals represent a certain kinship to us without uh, our having to agree with them on every you know, final point of church doctrine. However, there are also other groups that it's not so easy to uh, put them in a category, uh, and it makes the matter altogether different. The reason is simple. While uh, Catholicism, for instance, may stretch the boundaries of salvation by grace to many of us who are more reform-minded, and while Pentecostalism borders on uh, some hyster you know, histrionics or hysterics in some ways, these churches nonetheless share a, a common zeal for the greater uh, doctrines of Scripture that actually bind us together in Christ. 
I think the Apostles' Creed, for instance, is a good example of, of what beliefs separate uh, what are called Orthodox Christians or Christians of the traditional uh, you know, doctrine and theology from what most of us would consider to be heretical groups. And you can you know, name them in your mind or name them all you want. For Paul, the issue is circumcision. And it was critical enough to demand that either his opponents give up their false teaching or be forced out of New Testament fellowship. And what that tells us is, is that Christianity, while on the one hand is very uh, generous and, and very open and willing to receive any and everyone, at the same time there are limits uh, within which uh, we have to uh, follow the guideline of Scripture. Picking up in verse 11, it almost sounds, if you read this, uh, verse 11, it almost sounds as if Paul were grabbing the pen from his uh, secretary's hand, assuming he had one, and then writing in large letters himself the important points he wants to make. The only reason they do this, that is, that they circumcise people, he explains in verse 12, is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. In other words, their motives really weren't what uh, you would think. These circumcising heretics didn't have the good of the gospel of Jesus' sacrifice in mind. If anything, they were trying to downplay Jesus' cross by emphasizing Old Testament legalism. Evidently, people weren't happy with this preaching of the cross, and they were much more comfortable with this, the old school Judaism. Besides that, Paul says in verse 13, they not even circumcised them were keeping the Jewish law, so that they were, uh, you know, really kind of, it was odd for them to be insist that others keep it. They couldn't keep it themselves. Circumcision was a symbol of the law. It wasn't the law itself. And then he answers, or he answers himself about they're not keeping it. They want you to be circumcised so that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. And this kind of sounds foreign to us and a little bit strange, but really what they were doing, they were counting numbers. They were counting the numbers of those that they could persuade to join them or on their side of the argument in order to prove that, uh, that they were nothing less than loyal Jews. And so you know, the, the traditional Jews would leave them alone. Paul points out two reasons for the circumcisers' insistence that Gentile Christians be circumcised, and neither one of them was legitimate. Number one was to prevent them from being bullied or persecuted by fellow Jews, and the second was to chalk up points with those same bullies for adding to the circumcision side of the controversy. Meanwhile, Paul says in verse 15 that his boast is exclusively in Christ. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything to me. What counts is the new creation. And a fact of biblical truth is, is important enough so that it cannot be denied without offending God, we say that it's the law. In science, laws are undeniable facts of observation and meticulous testing. In society, laws are moral truths that, that can't be violated without threatening the safety of civilized society. Laws are supposed to protect law-abiding people from criminals. For thousands of years, civilization has gladly funded defenders of the law called police to arrest those who violate laws and threaten public safety. It just makes sense. However, even a criminal has the right to claim their innocence, leaving the burden of proof for any accusation against them upon the police themselves. This is called due process, and it's conducted under the authority of courts and overseen by judges who expect accusers to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt of their need for punishment of their crime. That proof is based on three elements, motive, opportunity, and means. You've probably heard this on some of these TV cop shows uh, before. So in this way, Paul had to prove the wrong motive of these Jewish circumcisers, he had to show clearly that they had taken the opportunity to violate God's truth. And finally, he had to demonstrate their means of accomplishing the crime of heresy. Now, right away in verse 11, Paul lets us know just how important this letter is to him. See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. When I was a kid, I always thought he'd used like, big pieces of chalk or Crayolas or something like that. But uh, I'm not sure what they used. But, uh, anyway, he's going to write it in big letters. This verse is really not a question so much as it is a statement of the importance of what Paul has already said and what he's about to say. Now you might recall from 1 Corinthians chapter 121, which the Apostle Paul had written that letter as well, Paul makes the statement, God was pleased to the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. 
that would be people like me and you. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. They reject it, we accept it. A stumbling block to Jews and, a, and foolishness to the Gentiles. This helps explain the accusation he makes in verse 12 in our passage where he says, those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised and the only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. So when it came right down to the choice between a stumbling block like the cross of Christ and suffering persecution for preaching that same cross, these circumcisers were predictably quick to abandon Jesus' crucifixion. According to Paul, his opponent's motive for insisting that the Galatians be circumcised wasn't for the good of the church or of Christianity. It was to save their own skin. That's why Paul, throughout this letter, refers to them as heretics and bewitching liars and so on. We can see that the motive for the circumcisers certainly wasn't to follow Christ. So something was definitely wrong here. After our terrible bus accident, six people had to be evacuated out of a steep canyon by helicopter. There were five men and one woman hanging from a rope being lifted out of this ravine. A hope the rope began to fray, so they all hurriedly agreed that at least one of them was going to have to let go before the rope broke and they all died. During a fast and furious discussion, they couldn't decide who should let go. So finally the woman spoke up in one of the most touching speeches you've ever heard. She told the other five men that a woman, that as a woman she had given her life to others because women are used to giving up things for their husbands and their children. After all, she said, with tears streaming down her face, men are the stronger sex and they must be saved. All of a sudden, the men began clapping and there she was alone hanging onto the rope. Now be careful when you think someone is doing you a favor. The circumcisers were interested in keeping the Old Testament law to avoid being bullied by their unconverted Jewish friends and associates. However, Paul was only interested in preaching Christ and him crucified, even if it meant opposing those who merely gave lip service to their faith. Like the hypocrisy we looked at in chapter 5 last week, or a couple of weeks ago, I can't remember, those not walking in the Spirit were a danger to those who were. Now, Paul goes further to the heart of the circumcisers' motives in verse 13. Not even those who are legally circumcised, he says, obey the law. Yet they want you to be circumcised so that they may boast about your flesh. In other words, these hypocrites who say they only want to keep the law by circumcising new converts actually want the Galatians to join in their legalistic hypocrisy, their pretentiousness, so that they can claim more members for their side of the argument, you know, sort of like mob rule, the people with the most agree, the people with the most uh, the, the most people who agree, they win. Even today, we hear folks brag about numerical additions to their way of thinking, as though it were proof that the proof was on that it was proof that the truth was on their side. Paul was exposing these less than pure motives of the heretics, revealing that they were simply using the occasion for an opportunity to exploit the Galatian Christians. He goes on to say in verse 14, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Now, I may be wrong, but when was the last time you heard about a church's phenomenal growth due to its emphasis upon, the teach, upon teaching the cross of Jesus Christ? If we were to put up a sign on 152 inviting commuters to, to join Calvary by picking up their crosses and selflessly following Jesus what do you suppose their reaction would be? For Paul, the Galatian problem really wasn't a matter of his opinion or anyone else's ideas. It was an issue of vital Christian truth. It was reality. Anyone who preaches a gospel for the sake of personal gain or safety instead of proclaiming God's glory in something as peculiar as Jesus' crucifixion is really not doing themselves or anybody else or any church any favors. When I and Janet bought our Toyota several years ago, it came equipped with the latest Bluetooth cell phone technology, you know, all integrated into the system. However, after a couple of days, Janet took the car back to the dealership, uh, explaining that the Bluetooth didn't work. Mrs. Ogan, the sales manager, explained, it works fine. The cell phone system in the car is completely automatic. All you need to do is tell it who you want to call, and it will automatically ring that person. Satisfied with the 
salesman demonstration, Janet drove away and she tried it for herself. Called Vanessa and sure enough, you know, she says it right into the dashboard and sure enough, back comes the response. Calling Vanessa. Needless to say, Janet was impressed. If she wanted to call one of the kids, all she had to do was say their name and the crazy thing would call one of our kids. As she was coming home that day, nearly convinced that she had now purchased the smartest car ever, she stopped at a traffic light. When the light turned green, she pulled out and suddenly an enormous SUV came towards her and almost smashed into the new Toyota. You idiot, she screamed at the top of her lungs. And almost immediately, the Bluetooth kicked in and you could hear my voice on the other end saying, Janet, did you call me? <laughs> I try to quit joke. I'm trying to be a better preacher, and it just isn't working out. So my jokes are lame. <laughs> anyway, sometimes opportunities are insights into real life and those whom we deal with daily. As far as Paul was concerned, the circumcisers had been exposed for taking a number of opportunities to deliberately and doctrinally mislead the Galatians, and so he arrested them called it what it was, a bogus attempt to empower themselves and not to honor Christ. The last proof of guilt in our trilogy of legal tests following motive and opportunity is means. If a person doesn't have a means for committing a crime, then it's not likely that they're guilty. However, in this case, Paul points out that the circumciser certainly had more than enough means for endorsing their false teaching. He says in verse 15 that neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything to me. What counts is the new creation. In other words, Paul knew that the believers who were circumcised, and he knew the believers who were not circumcised, and as far as he was concerned, they were all equally disciples. So insisting that Gentiles be circumcised was not only unnecessary, but disrespectful towards Jesus' cross. Well, in the, mind, well, in the minds of his Galatian opponents, anything less than strict adherence to the practice of circumcision was unacceptable. For Paul, the imposition of the Old Testament ritual upon New Testament converts clearly indicated that the circumcisers didn't believe Jesus' sacrifice was adequate, that it still needed the Old Testament. This was proof that something was wrong. And he demonstrates the means of the circumcisers whose, truth motives, whose true motives were opposed to Jesus and all that he really stood for. Their every opportunity had been, to, had been used to promote their own brand of religious salvation by means of circumcision rather than to glorify the full adequacy of Jesus' crucifixion. So an officer pulls a guy over who had obviously been speeding. I'll try one more time. He says to the driver, may I see your driver's license, please? The guy says, I don't have one. I had it suspended after my fifth DUI. As you can imagine, the policeman was shocked, and he said, okay, then let me see your registration. The speeder said, oh, well, this isn't my car. I stole it. The officer says, what do you mean you stole it? Yeah, it's stolen, said the driver, but come to think of it, I saw the owner's registration in the glove box when I was putting my gun in there. This time, the officer steps back and says a bit nervously, there's a gun in the glove box? Yes, sir, that's where I put it after I shot and killed the woman who, I, who's, uh, who owns this car, and I stuck her in the trunk. The policeman slowly pulled out his gun, and he said, hey, okay, buddy, get out of the car. I want to see your hands at all times. Yes, sir, said the driver. The officer immediately calls the captain for backup, and in no time, the speeder's car is surrounded, and the captain approaches the driver. The arresting officer explains to his captain what was going on, and the, and the, that the guy had a gun and was, had a murdered victim in the truck. Sir, can I see your license and registration, the captain said from a distance. Sure, said the driver, to which the original arresting officer was completely taken aback. Here it is, he said, grinning. Whose car is this, the captain asked, a little more relaxed. It's mine, said the driver. Well, the captain by now, or excuse me, the arresting officer is confused. Where's your gun? I don't have a gun, he said. The captain scratched his head and he said, I don't understand, this officer stopped you. And you told him that you didn't have a license, you stole a car, and had a gun in your glove box. And what's more, he said that you had a dead woman in the trunk. To which the driver smiled and said, yeah, and I'll bet that liar told you I was speeding, too. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to testing the limits of the truth, every one of us has plenty of potential and the means for stretching the truth as far as the mind can bear. 
That was the case for the circumcisers who had taken Abraham's original covenant of circumcision and turned it into an unholy sacrament of faith. Paul was unwilling to let this controversy go any further than it already had. And yet he was willing to put his apostolic reputation on the line to defend the full sufficiency of Christ and his crucifixion. Paul says in verse 17, Let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. It wasn't that Paul had tattooed himself with images of Jesus on his neck, nor had he taken a Sharpie pen and put crosses all over his hands and arms to show the dedication to Christ. The apostle had been physically beaten and locked up more than once by circumcising Jews. He'd been chased out of towns like Ephesus and stoned by, hello, by fellow Hebrews because he refused to compromise his preaching of Christ crucified and resurrected. Now, I don't doubt for a moment that Paul's struggles and persecution, as well as those of Peter and the other apostles, would have ended immediately if they had just gone along with their opponents. Had they toned down the importance of New Testament doctrines as offensive as the crucifixion, the cross of Christ, and his resurrection, most of the Old Testament Jews would have probably just left them alone. But Paul refused. And if anything, he only became more outspoken in his, in his insistence that Jesus and his cross was the exclusive means of forgiveness and salvation. It's not that he didn't think that good deeds and works of gracious love were unimportant characteristics of genuine faith. It's just that they were the product not the cause of one's salvation. Paul literally went to his grave convinced beyond all reasonable doubt that what Christ had done on the cross was not only sufficient for the forgiveness of sins, but so complete that for one to suggest that anything outside of God's grace had saved them was simply a lie. It was just flat out wrong. When it comes to certain issues of politics and doctrine, there's plenty of room for disagreement among sincere and honest Christians. Should we sprinkle? Should we immerse? Was Mary a perpetual virgin or just a virgin of Jesus? Or should we wear a mask or stay six feet apart? That sort of thing. However, when it comes down to the source of our salvation, yours and mine, for anyone or any church, including this one, to suggest that human forgiveness comes as the product of anything more or less than Christ's death on the cross, is just simply wrong. If you would stand with me. Lord Jesus has kind of gone a, a long way about it. But really, this message is pretty simple. Jesus died for our sins. We wear crosses around our neck. We have crosses on our churches. We, we cross ourselves. We do all kinds of things that represent the cross of Christ. And the truth of the matter is, it's a, really kind of an offensive symbol. I mean, think of it. I mean, here is the violence of murder, of injustice. And yet we embrace it as believers to be the very source of our salvation. How could anyone possibly come along and suggest otherwise? Lord, I pray that today we would have clarity, that we would understand beyond any, any reasonable doubt that Christ died and took the offense of our sins upon himself, demonstrating the ugliness, the utter terror, the destruction of sin, in his bloody and vile death, and in his going to the grave, buried himself and our sins so far away as the east is from the west. And then on the third day was resurrected so that we could have hope and all of this other circumcision and politics and everything else would just fade as we realize that Jesus, in fact, is the Savior. In his blessed name we pray. It's our custom to provide an opportunity for people to respond, but of course, the COVID uh, has sort of prevented that. <clears throat> you don't want to get too close to me anyway, because I'm full of ash and smoke. And nonetheless, uh, we want you to know that, uh, and especially those at home, if you, there is a decision that you've made through the course of today's service, or even through the course of this week, and you simply showed up to uh, demonstrate that decision, we want you to have some uh, recourse uh, and so please don't, uh, don't hesitate to stop me or someone from our church and let us know that uh, we really want to know more about this crucified Jesus that we, we preach about. 
Uh, we also have a website, cdclosbanos.com, where you can go and click on the various uh, opportunities that are, that are part of that as well. But we just want to encourage you to follow Christ as a, as a disciple, to be one uh, whom others can see in you uh, the truth, the, 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 good, the great news, the good news that sin has been uh, has been annulled, that uh, that there is forgiveness and salvation through Jesus Christ. And at this time, we'll have our uh, closing song, right? and, and also our announcements. I'm not used to. That. <clears throat> I just want to remind everybody again, as you leave the sanctuary today, um, the offering plate is up here in front. You can drop your offering off, or if you'd like to do it online, you just go to the website, click the little tab to give. Uh, those of you at home, the same thing, go to the website, to, uh, select the give tab. Uh, we are in need of your financial support, and we appreciate um, those who are faithfully typing. Um, but uh, we just want to encourage you all to be very familiar with the website, any Bible studies, Zoom groups. Um, things that are going on, it's all going to be publicized on there, and I know we're going to begin some Bible study soon, so keep your eyes out looking for that. We want to say happy birthday to those celebrating their birthday. Happy anniversary if you're celebrating that occasion as well. I, I got to tell you, it's so good to see you all with us. Some of your faces we haven't seen for a while, and so it's been a blessing to celebrate and sing and hear your voices singing with us. Um, those of you who are watching from home, we're worshiping with you in the spirit, and so thank you for um, tune in as well.